Hey everyone, back again. Today we're going to talk about Adrian Rich's Compulsory Heterosexuality and Lesbian Existence, which is a pretty seminal essay. Uh, and so, yeah, we'll get into it. Before jumping into that, if you want to follow me, you can do that um, on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. If you want to mostly see pictures of my cats, that is. If you want to help me out, you know, you can like, share, subscribe to this uh, channel. You can leave me five stars and, and comments and whatnot wherever you're listening to it and whether it's in podcast form or or whatever and yeah i want to extend a thanks to everyone who's helped me out monetarily because i have an unending appreciation for everything that you've done so yeah without wasting any more of your time let's hop right into this so adrian rich is writing very much at the time so this was written in 1980 at the time that feminist studies was more or less entering what is kind of reductively called this third phase of feminism or third wave of feminism, I should say. So more than just white women's experiences were starting to be considered and more than just heterosexual white women's experiences were starting to be considered. Now this text is undoubtedly focused on sexual orientation. She does touch on race a little bit, but it's not a significant part of this essay. Now, that doesn't mean that it's, you know, not not a worthy uh, text to talk about. It's just certainly one of the limitations of it that I just feel like putting out there before jumping into it. So her focus is to rally against not only compulsory, uh, compulsory heterosexuality, but to rally against feminism that is just tacitly assumes that heterosexuality is the only kind of sexual orientation. It's like the, the, the natural sexual orientation for men and women, to which Adrian Rich wants to uh, challenge. She, of course, wants to consider that this is only a tacit assumption because of certain other institutional factors that benefit from heterosexual couplings, heterosexual dynamics. So some strands of feminist thought believe that uh, lesbians were just reactionaries to male oppression, as though being a lesbian was only a political category, as though women couldn't actually possibly actually want to be with other women intimately, or uh, not even intimately, but just, just be among other women in a kind of, um, like in solidarity the form of kind of comradeship among women. And, you know, additionally, it was just viewed as being unnatural, like a, like a kind of mode of deviancy. And of course, there are clinical um, institutions that participated in that as well. So a lot of this text is her presenting other feminist authors, some of whom, you know, do wonderful things, for uh, women's equality or calling attention to male oppression of women, but that she says inadvertently perhaps, or unbeknownst to them, re reify heterosexual coupling as the primary and sole uh, sexual orientation that people can have. So one example she gives is uh, a Reinreich and English's book for her own good in which they talk about um, the view that, or they talk about how doctors would prescribe women certain kind of social actions, like to get married and to have kids for their own benefit. And of course, the authors point out that uh, really that was meant to enforce male dominion over women's bodies and to maintain certain economic um, economic. Um, conditions of society where women would be the ones caring for children while men could go out and do work, which fostered a cycle of dependency among women who could didn't have money to themselves. They were just left to, to the whims of their, their male counterpart. So Rich looks at this book, the one that I just kind of summarized, and says that the authors almost think that 
the problem itself is not with heterosexual coupling, but like as though heterosexual coupling has just been mutated into a kind of negative form because they still take the heterosexual dynamic to be the natural correct one and that it's just been uh, kind of marred by uh, capitalist interest, by other institutional formations, to which she says in order for us to be in her, I guess in her mind to be like properly feminist, it demands an an investigation of these tacit assumptions that underwrite our other projects. And this this issue gets compounded when you consider, or she was considering at the time as well, psychoanalytic feminists who took as like the base, the, the fact that there are always these kinds of heterodynamics, you know, between son and mother, between, uh, you know, uh, uh, husband and wife, like in their raising the children which just takes as, as a kind of foundational assumption the idea that the nuclear family is the correct form of, um, of child rearing. Now, of course, compulsory heterosexuality has had many effects. One of which, though, that she really focuses on and that stands out to me is that there is a conflation of women's eroticism and women's reproduction with men or men being the ones that can deliver those things. So because ostensibly we need a man and a woman to produce a child, then that means because that necessarily implies some kind of sexual act, if we're dealing with it in like purely biological terms, not in like a scientific setting, whatever, whatever that means, uh, what that then extends to is the idea that women's sexuality is contingent upon the presence of a man. So this opens the door for all kinds of control beyond the kind of economic dependency that I've already outlined. It extends to control over women's bodies as well and how their sexuality plays out. And she borrows from Kathleen uh, Go or Goff, who describes eight forms of male control, and they are to deny women uh, sexuality or to force it upon them, to command, to command or exploit women's labor to control their produce, to control or rob them of their children, to confine them physically and prevent their movement, to use them as objects in male transactions, to cramp their creativeness, and to keep them from, from knowledge-producing centers like schools and, and whatnot. And these cycles of control are maintained in the assumption that heterosexual coupling is what people must strive for. And this is obviously maintained by all of our popular media, you know, from such a young age, we're watching Disney films in the, in, you know, the North American context, at least watching Disney films in which that is all we ever saw. We only ever saw men and women uh, engaging in these kinds of sexual relations. There was no consideration of um, gay or lesbian couplings, let alone, you know, non-binary ones or non just non-cisgender ones. And it is through that that we come to internalize it as being natural. And in perhaps a less, um, or I guess a more malevolent way, the way in which pornography depicts men being the ones to deliver pleasure to women, where, and I'm sure that for anyone that's watched porn would know that it is a matter of men pleasing women and women are, you know, convulsed and they're un uncontrollable. And it is up to the man to deliver them from their writhing in order to give them the, the pleasure that they seek, which is a trope that extends very far back. Now in Rich's essay here, there are these streams that seem to hint at being against porn or sex work generally, which of course we should nuance because there are uh, sex workers that obviously love what they do and that that shouldn't be, we shouldn't condemn that. But there is, I think, some truth in there being a kind of cultural disposition towards pornography as, as a site for young men to learn how to treat women. And that has pretty negative effects. And that extends even to lesbian porn, where if you ever visit a porn site, lesbian porn will be like readily available. But in order to access gay porn, you have to go to the gay category. 
signaling to the viewer that lesbian porn isn't about gay couplings or isn't about homosexuality. It is about satisfying the male gaze, whereas gay porn is that kind of, I will just say, kind of deviant thing that you, you have to go and seek. You have to seek out because it's not for the male gaze like lesbian porn is. And then such treatment plays itself out in non-sexual ways, if we can even call what is seen on porn sex, in non-sexual ways in like the workplace, where women are constantly barraged with not only physical harassment, but verbal harassment in the form of jokes, sexual innuendos that position women as objects for men. And these often create dynamics in which a woman is expected to comply, like if a um, a, a sexual joke is said by a male colleague, the woman is expected to laugh, to kind of brush it off, to be cavalier about it, lest she experience or is um, targeted as a lesbian, you know, as being someone who isn't going to bow down to the male gaze. And of course, that has negative repercussions. It might mean a loss of a job. It might mean a loss of the opportunity for a promotion if that, you know, is even given to women. So we see how this plays out in an economic and political way, in a sociocultural one, where men would prefer to maintain their power as being the ones that can, you know, say what they want and hire their their less qualified white male buddies to uh, work alongside them while keeping more qualified women in subordinate positions in order to maintain a kind of cultural status, to accrue cultural capital. And, uh, you know, I've often heard this, this argument that like, oh, well, if the wage gap really existed, then wouldn't men just hire more women and pay them less? And that, you know, that argument only accounts for the fact that money, capital, is the only thing that people care about, that is men care about, when status is also on the line. They would rather interact with other men than women. And so they would take that that pay cut, essentially, or they would take that um, the opportunity to pay their colleagues more if it meant it could be with men, then pay them less if it meant it could be they could be with women. Because as soon as women start entering these ranks in en masse, then we see is the dissipation of something greater than their bank accounts. We see the dissipation of their superior status. And so each of these instances, these repeated instances, contribute to the naturalization of these dynamics, as though men are just kind of naturally geared towards treating women like subordinates, like objects for the male gaze, which has often been used in cases to justify men sexually assaulting women because it's just evolutionary or it's natural when in fact we know very well that these things are not because if they were natural then clearly every single man would participate in it but that is simply not the case it then corresponds to something fundamentally different than biology because it's not like everyone does it and it must then correspond to a political social um, consideration that gives men bestows upon them the power to do this. So in the face of this, in the face of the real experiences of women in relation to oppressive men, and in the face of feminists who refuse to acknowledge that lesbianism is in itself a legitimate sexual orientation, as legitimate than the heterosexual matrix in which we are, you know, immersed, she, she proposes, instead of thinking about it in terms of lesbianism, to consider the framework in terms of lesbian experience, which is meant, or sorry, lesbian existence, sorry, which is meant to highlight the fact that lesbian women have existed forever. It isn't just a new political category that emerges in response to growing economic disparity, as some feminists uh, might claim, or to consider it in terms of lesbian continuum. Now, this is where I, I like this term a lot, because for her, lesbian continuum is meant to expand the category of le lesbian identity beyond sexual acts to consider as well the kinds of affiliations that can be drawn or that can be coordinated, that can be formed between women in a kind of, um, as a kind of form of solidarity against male tyranny. So what this means is privileging something like friendship between women 
as valid as as valid as marriage which you know from such a young age women and and men to a lesser extent but women certainly are essentially sold the idea that all they are good for is marriage and then beyond that what they are good for is having babies what if it was a matter of women being told that the friendships that they will form that will most likely outlast marriages given the the rates in which marriages fail are so much more important and how these kinds of friendships can make something like raising children significantly easier if you had women to actually help you not grown man children who themselves don't know how to clean clean themselves who don't know how to feed themselves who are essentially just another child to feed which of course is a a pretty negative experience and so many women so many studies have been done about the kind of general level of happiness between heterosexual women and lesbian women and you know lesbian women have a pretty uh good go of things in relation to uh heterosexual women because i mean just look how many women out there who might be listening are with a 35 year old man child who doesn't know how to make the bed not to come you know sorry sorry if i'm causing anyone to get upset uh it's i just think it's important that you recognize that that's not okay or actually let me frame it this way for men listening you should know that being adult an adult requires you to be a partner not someone subjugating women and if you want to downvote this video i would certainly welcome it from anyone that disagrees so all this has been maintained essentially through popular culture which i've already touched on and one way to illuminate this that is probably the best is the uh, what is called the bechdel test which i've mentioned before but the bechdel test is the test in which you assess if there's a scene in a movie and there are like some uh, characteristics of this test that i'm just not i won't touch on but like generally it is the assessment to see whether in a movie two women talk to each other without a man present talk to each other about something that isn't about a man or about what a man is doing and you will find very few movies pass this and even if they do pass it most of the time it's just for like one moment in which two women happen to say something uh that wasn't related to a man or uh we can consider the way that in so many movies in which there's like a woman present she is always asking questions to the man like always asking what the man thinks or like what the man is going to do or anything like that which just feeds into this of course so in the end here she kind of calls for a move beyond white western feminism to consider of course the ways that black women have historically drawn alliances among themselves because of their kind of mutual uh stake within patriarchal relations in order to move beyond the white heterosexual framework of the west that is just so oppressive now she concludes by suggesting that we don't frame the problem as being one between good and bad sexual orientations or good and bad forms of like romantic couplings because for her you know that just uh revitalizes a kind of binarism that that is just going to be too reductive to consider the problem in that way is for her to is to consider the problem wrongly and the matter is instead about considering the ways that heterosexual compulsory heterosexuality is enforced and for what reasons it is enforced and for whose benefit and that more or less covers it um in this text she makes so many references to different feminist thinkers and different books and i didn't go into great detail about them because it would each one would have required me to give like a brief synopsis and that would have been hard to follow uh so in order to get the full-fledged experience you really have to jump into the text itself and it's not a difficult read it's really truly really accessible and really seminal in in this field obviously and yeah let me know what you think if i was too hard on men then i i I'd, I'd like to hear about it uh because i'm chances are you'll be wrong but anyways uh i'd still love to hear about it And yeah, take care.